Welcome to CCAG's February 2024 broadcast. Special welcome to all our new viewers and massive thanks to our regular viewers. So what we're going to talk about this month? Well, this month, we're going to take a closer look. It's a new model proposed for safeguarding the Earth's major natural systems, including the Arctic and the Amazon. We'll begin our discussion with an address by Professor Johan Rockström, who was co-lead of the interdisciplinary team of scientists who developed the Commons concept. Johan is joined by CCAG's Sir David King and Professor Mark Maslin. Our esteemed guests are Julia Busab Fonseca and Dr. Laura Pereira. Julia is Head of Governance and Strategy at the Amazon Chamber, the first global hub dedicated to the Amazon bioeconomy. She's also the co-founder of Climatica, a consultancy that operates to put climate and people at the core of decision making. And she is currently researching climate justice and finance at the University of Sussex. Laura is an associate professor at the Global Change Institute at Wits University, where her work focuses on sustainability transformations in developing country contexts. And she's also a member of the Seeds of Good Anthropocene project and the Biosphere Futures Con uh, project. I'm also delighted that we'll be joined virtually by Beth Doherty, climate activist and member of the Youth Led Action Network were Arctic angels. So the planetary commons, as you said, Johan, it holds considerable promise to rethink, design and implement global governance regimes to protect the planet. Over to you. Thanks, thanks, Ade. And great to be with you. And uh, so this is uh, really exciting. It is a recent paper in the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences. It's three years of work. It actually started with a report already in 2016. It is basically based on all the evidence we have that we're now threatening the stability and the life support systems on the entire Earth system, requiring from us a whole new paradigm of how to govern the stability of all the biophysical systems that regulates collectively the livability on Earth. And if we put some slides on, I'll just walk you through the evidence behind the paper and then give you a few highlights uh, on, on our conclusions and also indicating what, what this uh, may imply moving forward. And you can click forward twice. There we are. So in, in summary, uh, the evidence over the past 30 years shows which is the evidence behind why we need a whole new paradigm to govern the planetary commons, is number one, that we have now unequivocal evidence that we're in an old new geological epoch. We've entered the Anthropocene. We, humanity, the global world economy, our globalized world, is a dominating force of change on planet Earth. We also have ample evidence from ice core data and, and all the paleoclimatic science that the Holocene, the last 10,000 years since we left the last ice age, is a uniquely stable, interglacial, equilibrium state of the Earth system. The only state we know for certain can support the world as we know it. The third piece of evidence supporting uh, coming to a whole new governance paradigm is the fact that the Earth system is a complex, self-regulating system dominated by feedback dynamics, which means that large biophysical systems regulate the planet's state through feedbacks and if you push the systems too far like the ice sheets or the uh, arctic amazon rainforest big systems like the overturning of heat in the north atlantic you can push them over tipping points and they can self-reinforce and get stuck in a new equilibrium state which can undermine the support for the stability of the planet this is what requires planetary stewardship. Is this a new uh, insight? If you take the next slide, the answer is no. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in the sixth assessment for the first time, if you click again, comes out with quite some remarkable conclusions, given that this is the conclusion and, and consensus across the entire climate science community. Not only are we deep in the climate crisis, threatening human well-being today, we're also threatening the stability of the planet. This is now agreed upon across the entire climate science community. 
But not only that, mm. it's also now clear from the IPCC work that solving the climate crisis will not be done by phasing out fossil fuel alone. It's a necessary but not sufficient criteria. We also need to protect the global commons, protect the systems on Earth that keeps the buffering capacity, the dampening capacity, the 56% of carbon dioxide absorbed in nature on land and in the ocean to dampen the warming from fossil fuel burning, the 90% of heat absorbed in the ocean to dampen the stress caused by the energy imbalance. So this is now mainstream, if you take the next slide, that we need to become stewards of the entire planet. And that is what has been the entry point. And if you take the next slide, there you are. Uh, to, to come at, at a question of what are the global commons, one very important strand of science is the tipping point science. That is what has been informing the planetary boundary setting. What is the safe operating space for humanity within quantified safe boundaries? And if you take the next, I show you this because it's the first time we're now able to map all the so-called tipping element systems, the large biophysical systems that fulfill two criteria. When they are in a healthy state, within safe planetary boundaries, they help to dampen stress caused by, for example, climate change. But push them too far, and they tip over because they have multiple stable states. Mm -hmm. You see the 16 on the map here. They're across the entire planet. They're on land. They're in the ocean. They're in the cryosphere. They're in the biosphere. The breakthrough in this work is the color scheme here. And if you click again, you'll see the five systems that are likely to cross their tipping points already at 1.5 degrees Celsius. And just look at these systems, the Greenland ice sheet, the West Antarctic ice sheet, together they represent 10 meter sea level rise. Abrupt thawing of permafrost in Siberia, you have the loss of the barren sea ice, and losing all the tropical coral reef system, livelihoods for over 300 million people. Now these are therefore systems that not only would have massive impacts and undermine intergenerational justice, but they're also biophysical systems, which if they stay in the Holocene state, they actually help to cool the planet, to dampen stress caused by the climate forcing from fossil fuel burning. But let them cross a tipping point, and they will not only have impacts on societies, but they also lose buffering capacity, carbon uptake, albedo, ability to absorb heat. If you take the next, this is why we have been working for now two decades on, on advancing the science of setting quantitative boundaries for a safe operating space. You know, when you add the evidence of the Anthropocene, the Holocene as a desired reference point of the planet we depend on, and tipping points, that's what taken us to the planetary boundary framework. And if you take the next, you may have seen this, we now have, in 2023, published the third scientific update on the planetary boundaries, quantifying all the nine boundary systems, giving us a safe operating space in green, and unfortunately concluding that six of the nine boundaries are outside of their Holocene uh, stability domain, meaning that we are putting the entire planet's stability at risk. It's not only climate, it is also, as you see here, biodiversity loss, land system change, overconsumption of fresh water, both green water, soil moisture, which powers the whole photosynthesis, but also blue water, which keeps all the aquatic ecosystems functioning in our freshwater systems, and overloading of nitrogen and phosphorus, and overloading also of chemicals. Now, the question arose when this science had been published the first, second time, actually, in 2015. What governance regime does this imply? How does this change our perspective on, on the commons in the world. And that is what took off the planetary commons science. So if you take the next, the question that we posed is, is what is on the screen here. What are the systems on Earth we now need to manage to be able to stay with this, within this safe operating space? That is the, the, the definition of a planet that can support current and future generations. Now, there's been a lot of hints of science indicating what these systems are. I showed you earlier the tipping point mapping, which of course keeping the tipping points on the right side of the fence is one. If you take the next slide, another piece of work, which is I think also pointing in the direction of the planetary commons, is the mapping of the so-called irrecoverable carbon. 
showing the 140 gigatons of carbon sitting in big, big biomes, which, one, are at risk of being lost. But secondly, if we lose them, we won't be able to bring them back. And and again, it just is to share with you that that science increasingly shows that we have this collective responsibility of keeping both biological and physical systems intact. So if you take the next slide, this is what then brought us to the big question. Do we now have to bring forward a new science on complementing the conventional view of the global commons into what is defined as the planetary commons? And it all started, if you take the next slide, in 2016 with a report actually commissioned by nothing less than the uh, Global Environment Facility led by Naoko Ishii at the time who wanted to know how should we guide the 1 billion US dollars in the largest financial mechanism of the United Nations for eco for protecting ecosystems, the Global Environment Facility. This was a work led by the International Institute for uh, Applied Systems Analysis, IASA, in Austria, together with, with us at the, at the Potsdam Institute, suggesting that, yes, we have to redefine the global commons. But what are the global commons, if you take the next? Well, just a little reminder, the global commons are understood since over 50 years as the systems on Earth that are outside of national jurisdictions, meaning they're owned by nobody, but therefore by all of us, and that we need rules of how to manage them in order primarily to regulate their exploitation. So we have so far only four global commons that are kind of understood in the legal regimes in the world. The high seas and the deep seabed, the atmosphere, out to space, and Antarctica. And if you take the next, we do have treaties around all of these four. The high seas treaty for the high seas, of course, the United uh, Nations Framework Convention and the whole IPCC COP process for climate the Outer Space Treaty since 1967, and, and the really successful and important Antarctic Treaty from 1961. So these are kind of well-established also in, in the legal regimes. But remember that they're predominantly there to ensure that we collectively uh, exploit them in a way that is uh, considered fair from other nation states. But... If you take the next slide, this is something that we need to go beyond because we now must recognize that we have these spheres that regulate the fundamental functioning of the Earth system. So what we define in this new work is that the global commons in the Anthropocene, in this state where we're putting all the pressure on the planet, have to be redefined as no longer being just the systems outside of national jurisdictions, but rather being the biophysical systems that contribute to regulate the functioning the resilience and the state of the planet, meaning the system that we all human beings in any nation, in any society, at any scale, depend on collectively for the stability of the living environment that we all depend on. And if you take the next, that is what led us to a paper that is um, co-authored by lawyers, governance scientists, earth system scientists, climate scientists, quite, a, quite an endeavor of, of interdisciplinarity. It led to, if you take the next slide, to quite a messy table on the candidate systems. So I won't walk through this, but what you see on the vertical are the spheres that regulates the whole Earth system. The atmosphere, the biosphere, the hydrosphere, the lithosphere, and the cryosphere. And just to point that the Amazon rainforest is there, the Arctic is there, uh, the AMOC is there, the, the overturning of heat system in the Gulf Stream. Uh, the big ice sheets. So the tipping elements are considered in the scientific assessment as part of the planetary commons and that they fulfill this criteria. We all depend on them. So it means that the Amazon rainforest is not a business only of, of the riparian states in, in the Amazon basin. It's something that we all are responsible for, but that we also all depend on. And that, of course, has massive, would have massive governance implications if we would really take that seriously. But I can just share with you that President Lula da Silva at COP28 in Dubai actually made a clear public statement that he considers the Amazon a global common, something that we collectively depend on and that they are custodians of the systems for humanity. And I'll close by just, if you put to the next slide, just to say that I believe that this um, is, of course, 
a paradigm shift, but it's also part of what we know is necessary, namely a transformative pathway back within a safe operating space. There's no linear incremental journey anymore. We are at this urgent emergency state in order to avoid irreversible, unmanageable, unjust outcomes at the planetary scale. So even though the planetary commons may be outside of the conventional thinking today in in governance and political science, um, I believe that this is something we have to take very seriously and bring on to the agenda to discuss how we govern our pathway to avoid unmanageable risks. And with that, back to you, Ade, and opening the discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, dense and scientifically dense and, and, and technical um, presentation, but super, super interesting. I just want to um, break it down before. One quick question for, for people who might have found that quite scientifically dense. Can you explain, Johan, just briefly what the Anthropocene is and uh, the Holocene and why us moving into the Anthropocene is seen as so precarious? Yeah. So, and I'll do this very short. Don't don't be too nervous if I start by saying over the past one million years, <laughs> planet Earth we know have been have been dancing between hundred thousand year long ice ages and short interglacial period. These are defined as Milankovic cycles. Well understood. It's all driven by our our distance and and the angle of the Earth's axis to to the Sun. This is well understood. Interglacial periods, 15 to 30,000 years, 100,000 year ice ages. We have, as modern humans, been on Earth for two ice ages and one interglacial, so roughly 250,000 years. We leave the last ice age 20,000 years ago, minus six degrees of global mean surface temperature, and we enter this extraordinarily stable interglacial epoch that geologically, geologists call the Holocene. So this is an interglacial is a warm period of planet Earth. We've had six to eight such warm periods over the past one million years. And it's so important because not only has it a remarkable stability in terms of temperature and hydrology, it's also at that point that we shift from being living in caves as hunters and gatherers and going through the Neolithic Revolution, domesticating animals and plants and becoming farmers. This is the this is like the kickoff point of civilizations as we know it. This this is when we start the journey as modern societies. So that is the Holocene. Now, the Anthropocene is based on ample evidence, not from models, but from observations showing that up until 1950, so it's quite interesting, we go through the Neolithic Revolution 8,000 years ago, we start agricultural societies, but in 1950, we have this kickoff point which is called scientifically the moment of the great acceleration, where we go from linear impacts to exponential rise. You've all heard us talk about the hockey stick. Well, I can tell you the hockey stick is not only carbon dioxide. The hockey stick is essentially everything that matters for human well-being in nature. Air pollution, deforestation, overfishing, all forms of land degradation, expansion of, of land and loss of biodiversity, all of them have the same pattern. Linear change up until 1950, bang, exponential rise from that point onwards. That is the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene is today understood as the moment wow. when we shift gear and start having this global pressure on planet Earth. And, and that is now defined as a new geological epoch. So Anthros is Greek for human. Mm -hmm. So it's the human epoch, mm -hmm. Anthropocene. And um, yeah, so there we are. Yeah. Excellent. Um, yo, and that was fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I mean, I Googled it and it was nowhere near as good as your explanation. So this is why you're here. Thank you so much. Let's move on to um, talking about the, 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 the planetary commons. Um, you know, uh, we can all under, we're all in agreement of the urgent need to protect the Earth's life-sustaining systems. But I want to pro probe more into the feasibility and the practicality uh, of the commons concept. Now, how can decision-making within the planetary commons uh, be exercised under an umbrella? For instance, how can we make sure that the voices and the knowledge of indigenous peoples 
uh, local communities and vulnerable populations and not just included, but they're I mean, what, for example, would happen if this was a of indigenous people? Mm. Yeah, no, I mean, no, nobody's, um, is, is under underestimating the, the complexity here, but let's, let's, for example, say that uh, let, let's assume that we don't take on all the planetary common candidates but start with uh, the arctic uh, the coral reef systems and the amazon i think these these are three top candidates because they're so close to their tipping points so many indigenous communities and local communities depend on them and and they are um, um, not governed in in any commons commons sense today so what, what would this imply? Well, the way we are reasoning it in this paper is that if they would be legally defined as planetary commons, those nations and those indigenous communities residing within them would have the right to um, request compensation and request support from all the other nations in the world because all the nations are, of the world depend on them being managed in a, in a sustainable way. So it would be a legally based framework that would enable compensation to these communities for their um, service to humanity to be custodians of these systems as, as just a one entry point. Now that is easy to say, of course, because for the Arctic, for example, we have multiple pressures and the dominant pressure is, is climate change. So here, of course, I think the planetary commons concept, if you would adopt that for the 4 million indigenous communities living in the Arctic, I think it would not be a compensation scheme for them. It would rather be one more very, I hope, or could be a powerful argument for them to say, what right do you have to destroy this commons? Because this commons is, is our livelihood base. And of course, that would be a pressure point on on the climate transition potentially yeah it's i mean it's really fascinating because we when we create these concepts and these new um uh, situations we want to make sure that the indigenous communities um and local communities have they their say and we want to make sure it's empowering because we know they have so much knowledge to share um the, the 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 planetary commons concept also focuses on um well it focuses on natural systems such as the amazon but why isn't it extended um to fossil fuel assets or even global wealth yeah well of course that that can be discussed but i mean the the boundary conditions we we put on this we enter this from an earth system science perspective with only one objective keeping the planet in a holocene like state to maintaining a healthy planet a planet that can continue having being dominated by dampening buffering resilience based feedbacks that keeps the life support environmental conditions in a in a in a in a beneficial state for us so of course in that uh, with that entry point the focus is on on the biological, the geological, the physical systems on Earth. Fossil fuels uh, would be uh, is rather a driver threatening that that stability, mm -hmm. and 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 wealth or, or or equity is of course fundamental, but they are kind of outcomes of our ability. These these commons, these planetary commons, thereby come upstream of um, of the integrated interaction with, with with human societies so it's it's more the boundary conditions that we set on the definition okay okay well thank you johan um as i said that was um really comprehensive and very very interesting i think it's time for us to open this up to the rest of our panel um laura you have a particular experience of planetary tipping points alongside african ecosystems and how to create transformative futures for people and nature in Africa. Now, could you ex share with us your perspective of the planetary commons? What do you think about it, um, especially in relation to the African continent and what we need to see to make this governance system work for the people? 
Cool. Thank you so much for that and for the opportunity to be able to engage with this panel and with this discussion, um, because these are the critical topics of our time. Um, as as Professor Rogstrom has has mentioned, you know, we're, we're we're at this point of planetary crisis, and we need to do something about it. Um, but I think sort of the choices that we make about the kinds of transformations that that we know we need to enable in order to get onto a, a safe and just um, trajectory for for people and planet um, are, are quite critical. And so these, these concepts are important to unpack. Um, and it's always interesting for me, uh, you know, you, uh, you, and you mentioned um, very rightly, you know, we're looking at um, the, the cryosphere, Amazon coral reefs are some of these critical, critical um, sort of life support systems that are, are nearing these critical thresholds. Um, and for me, what's really interesting about that is that these are based in places either in the global south or where it's indigenous communities that have largely been custodians, right? If we're looking at the Arctic, if we're looking at um, at the Amazon or, or at coral reefs. Um, and, so, and so your question around the role of indigenous peoples, local knowledge systems, um, I think really does come to the fore. And you've seen that play out no more like radically than on the African continent. And I think that if we're going to get this idea of a planetary commons right, and I think from an Earth systems perspective, it makes a lot of sense. We need to maintain these systems irrespective because once we lose them, all hell breaks loose, right? Um, but how we do it needs to come from an understanding of what, which anthropos, right? Sort of unpacking the idea of the Anthropocene, who's actually been driving these critical systems into a tipping point, and is that where we need to be intervening in order to maintain these critical systems? And maybe that actually comes fundamentally from the underlying Western governance systems that we've used to manage these resources around individual governance, et cetera, because you saw a complete erosion. Colonization did, um, did a very good job on the African continent of erasing indigenous governance mechanism systems um, that, uh, sorry, that's the director of my institute just coming in to give you a copy. Apologies. Um, that <laughs> sorry, and most so, of the other... yeah, someone would bring me in a cup of tea as well. So yeah, I, I... <laughs> like that. that. <laughs> um, so yeah, sort of alternative governance systems that don't really look at um at kind of individual property ownership of sort of these profit maximizing models of understanding that there are different ways of organizing the commons. And I think if we draw on those um, knowledge systems that and governance systems that were erased through sort of uh, colonization in this understanding of planetary column, uh, commons, then we might be able to bring much more transformative, much more radical, much more place-based solutions to maintaining these spaces that aren't actually impacting on sovereignty. Because unfortunately, when you're looking at the Amazon, it is based in place. It is based in people's land. And so, you know, what claim do the rest of us really have around, you know, being able to say to um, the indigenous people in the Amazon or to Brazilians or Colombians or, you know, this is how you're supposed to be using this resource because you've protected it for so long and it's really critical for the rest of us. Um, yeah, so really important. We need to come from that. And from the African perspective, um, you know, there's been a lot of narrative talk and I'll, I'll be very quick on this um, around, you know, we need to plant more trees. We need to sequester carbon. We need to plant trees, and Africa is a really good place to do that. Look at look at all these savannas and grasslands where we can put in more trees. We're like, hold on a second, no, these are not degraded ecosystems. Just because they don't look like your ecosystems, they're they're our ecosystems. We've co-evolved with them over generations, um, and they fulfill a lot of benefits for people, the planet, and and those are important. Um, so we shouldn't be. Um, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, I think, at this point, with a lot of these interventions that we're talking about. Um, yeah, it's a really good concept, needs a lot of perspectives from various parts of the world. And I think, um, yeah, learning from the, the case of colonization of Africa, its governance systems, we can really learn how to do this better at the planetary level. Yeah. Thank you so much, Laura, for that co contribution. I mean, um, breaking it down simply, it's kind of like, first of all, admitting that we are a uh, part of the problem. We are the ones who have caused a lot of the issues on the planet and also to respect the, the wishes and, um, and learn from the indigenous people, you know, who are, who are living in these areas, who are the custodians of these systems. Um, I think that trying to 
say. And, um, and also cheers to you, Laura, for I've got uh, my own drink as well. Um, let's move on. I want to hear from Julia um, a, a, as well and get your um, working aside, working alongside local communities to build stronger forest um, governance. In, what in your experience have been the most considerate, most important considerations when doing this work? And how might we relate this to the planetary commons model? Julia. Uh, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here and discussing this topic, which is uh, so important for us, given our current situation, uh, global climate situation, right? Uh, so my experience um, working with the Amazon region, I've been working with indigenous peoples and in protection of the Amazon for more than 10 years. I can see that, that there are lots of uh, correlated re issues here. When uh, Professor Rockstrom said about the tipping point of the Amazon, it is quite clear that the Amazon is, uh, is reaching out it, its tipping point, uh, given that the forest is being uh, more and more patched. Uh, so the, the the deforestation is dividing the ecosystems and the, the integration of the ecosystems is compromising the capacity of the forest uh, to keep um, its um, uh, climate um, uh, its climate uh, role uh, contribution. So the Amazon is is uh, is it, it might become a problem a problem to to um, to uh, climate change instead of a solution. So this, what we are talking about, the Amazon, when you say that the, the forest is reaching out its tipping point, is that uh, the, the forest can contribute more to emissions than to uh, carbon sequestration or storage. And uh, but when we when we see the governance of the Amazon, we see we see that the forest, uh, the the parts of the, the forest that are, are are still keeping the, the the carbon are the indigenous peoples' protected areas. So the role of indigenous peoples to protect the Amazon and, and to 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 keep the planet a safe a safe place to live is is crucial um, because indigenous peoples they they have the, the capacity to uh, to manage the forest to manage uh, the biological resources uh, in a way that they have been doing that for uh, millennia. So the the issue of uh, go local governance is quite critical here. So the and the the, the protection of their knowledge and that the capacity to 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 get, take this knowledge from local to global governance is really important. But of course, as uh, Professor Rockstrand said, uh, the, the governance of knowledge is an issue. It's a, it's a very challenging thing that we see when when we talk about the global global climate governance uh, because we have like this knowledge that are very localized and very diversified as uh, local knowledge is not, we cannot say local knowledge as just one single thing as indigenous peoples have lots of different local knowledges and uh, managing this diversity of knowledges and taking it up to the global governance is, is a very challenging thing. Uh, and uh, this challenge is, 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 is limiting the capacity of their resources to protect the forest to come down and reach out the ground. And uh, from my experience, what I hear from uh, indigenous peoples is that um they 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 are, they, are, they mostly criticize the global climate governance uh from the uh financial resources distri distribution perspective uh so what what it, we have today is that uh, more like between 20 and 25% of the global uh greenhouse gases emissions come from the forestation of tropical forests but just 1% less than 1% of the um climate finance is flowing towards indigenous peoples. So it's just 1% comparing to the role that they have uh, in protecting forests is, is nothing, you know, it's minimal. Uh, so when, when we, we talk to indigenous peoples about uh, their uh, lack of trust in the global climate governance, it usually comes, it, it, it really, it usually is related to their lack of trust in the distribution of climate resources, climate finance resources. Uh, so when, when when I see that uh, you know that the critical part of like distributing resources to strengthen their capacity to protect their territories, we are talking about strengthening our capacity to, to give them the money that they need to protect the forest because they are dealing with a very powerful force from global uh, commodity commodity organizations, global commodity companies that are just uh, how can I say that that is just like you know. Reaching out, they, they it just like it 
flattening their their territories. So then, in order to make them stronger to to uh, to face this this force, they they need a better economic capacity to deal with that. This is what why uh, now Brazil and Professor uh, Carlos Nobody are always talking about the the bio economy of the Amazon, which means that um, it, it's an economy that is. Um, that really strengthen the capacity of the forest uh, to to make economic resources from the standing forest, um, and yeah. So this is and so and just taking it to the local governance of uh, Brazil from Brazil, the just uh, Lula da Silva last year with Marina Silva, they they just renewed the the Brazilian. Uh, national policy to protect the forest and they th- this was the first time that they created a uh, a federal uh, agency for bioeconomy which means that they are now recognizing the, the importance of having a an economy for the forest that will protect the forest which means that we need a, a, a type of economic model that can face the economic model that is not working for protecting the forest so yeah, so this is a this is this is my perspective from my my experience uh, when we talk about the governance of local resources and the governance of local knowledge and how to take this knowledge uh, to the global governance. It's like okay, so we we need to find a way that local people, local organizations, can face the economic forces that are destroying the forest. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Julia. And I think you hit on um, some really good points, you know, and and, uh, I mean, the crux of it is success of the planetary commons is going to come from trust. You know, this is something that is really hard that we haven't um, garnered over the years, uh, especially trust from indigenous people. And that that trust will start through, he could show them the money um they've been the custodians of these um of these of these areas for trees for millennia um and yet been suffering the hardest so thank you so much julia um i want to bring sir david in on this now as well and uh sir dave as someone who's been deeply involved in climate diplomacy you know what strategies do you think are the most effective in fostering international cooperation. Um, Addy, can I just step back from your question for a moment and address what uh, what what we've been listening to about the the global commons uh, and how we might uh, govern that. I want to say that I think uh, uh, Laura and Julia have made a critically important contribution. What we need to do is understand from the indigenous people, how they managed the natural world. And that management was all to do with the fact that they lived in equilibrium with their ecosystems. And of course, we now have a financial system and an economic system throughout the world, apart from the remaining indigenous people, where this concept is simply not counted in. And by this I mean that there is no real value or there has been no real value attached to our ecosystems. And I want to say that I I do believe this is one heck of a big challenge to try to change the governance procedures. So for example, if we look at the, the Amazon, many countries are in control of those bits of the lithosphere, the land, um, and Uh, The Brazilians, I'm sure, would be very upset if an international body was to tell them how to operate in in the Amazon. Now, it is true that the Brazilians have had governments with contrary views on managing the forests, and we've now got a president back in place who does understand the importance of that uh, part of the lithosphere. But nevertheless, if we set up global organizations which are intended to overstep the uh, power of the local government, we, we are creating a, a very, very big challenge for ourselves. I mean, the same is true of the Arctic. The Arctic is subdivided into national property. But it's also true of many of the ocean-based systems 
where countries have their extended economic zones into 1,000 kilometers from their coastlines unless there's another country in, in the same uh, sphere. Um, and, and what that means is, for example, the Great Barrier Reef is part of the jurisdiction of the Australian government. And so how do we, how do we overcome these national interests with that international view, which I fully support. I think Johan's view is absolutely right. But I'm just pointing out the enormous challenge that is posed by the, the global governance issue. I want to add, the indigenous people of the world have suffered from Western civilization over the past few hundred years, many hundreds of years. How many countries have got their original indigenous populations still in place? Whether you go to South America or Africa or uh, anywhere else, uh, the, the Arctic Circle region, what rights do those indigenous people have today uh, within those, uh, those countries? The indigenous people have been reduced to small numbers and they have very little say in the way the governance of their countries operates. And um, now I don't want to be sounding as if there's no solution to this, but I do believe it's critically important that we understand that it involves a cultural revolution. We need to understand that our global economic system, that free market system that has served us so well in spreading wealth around the world, is no longer fit for purpose in a planet with 8 billion people. That, that model is what we are really saying we have to overwhelm. The free market system is what destroys the forests in Brazil and the same around the world because the wood is, is valuable in other parts of the world because the beef that would otherwise roam in those areas is exported to other parts of the world. The demand is very high. So I, I think I'm going to say we need a philosophical and cultural transition towards an ecological civilization in which we understand that we all are a part of nature and not apart from nature. Sorry, Addy, I didn't quite address your question. <laughs> but I think it's a really challenging situation that we're now discussing. If I come to global decision-making, of course, the indigenous people, and we focused on them, have no voice at all in the global decision-making processes, whether it's the uh, G30 or G20 or G8 or COP processes, they have no voice at all, really. So I, I think the voices of uh, Laura and Julia are critical in this whole debate, and we need a follow-through. When you don't answer my questions, when you come across with so many really salient and important points. Now, I, I think you, you, you've you made some uh, really, really powerful points. And uh, I, I've been reading a book, I think a lot of people have read it, called Sapiens. And, you know, one of the things it talked about was us humans going through a cognitive revolution, you know. And I think as well as a cultural revolution, we need a cognitive re revolution in the way we think completely because this this is overwhelming us what is happening at the moment. And in order to be able to deal with it, we have to have a new way of understanding. And I think you touched upon that very well, um, Sir Dave. I, I'm, I'm gonna move on just mainly because we're short for time um, to Mark. And I mean, Mark, you recently made a, a brilliant video uh, with the comedian Joe Brand, British comedian, on the challenge presented by the climate crisis. And it ended with a really critical point. And it says that we need to do everything, but five times faster. I mean, do you think something like the Planetary Commons can support this need for speed, Mark? Well, Ade, as you know, I absolutely love big ideas. And this idea by Johan and his colleagues is one of the biggest. The idea that governance is key. And again, I keep saying that governance is the key solution to climate change and all the others. The way we govern things is critical. Because if you think about it, if we step back, and I'm going to do as Sir David did, and think about things slightly broader, we have enough money 
in the world now in our economic system to lift everybody out of extreme poverty and to solve climate change and to protect the planetary commons. But we don't. And I'm going to pick up on what you said and also what Dave said, which is, look, we need to think differently. Humanity needs to think as a global species. And that's really difficult. I mean, we've only emerged from Africa about 100,000 years ago. We're really good as individuals. We're really good at family. We're not bad at cities. And nation states, well, maybe uh, not as good as we would like. But we have no real understanding how to govern a planet for the good of everybody. And I think that's critical. And I'm going to pick up on what uh, Sir David said. I mean, we have 200 countries or nearly 200 countries, all of which have very different governance models. Even if we pick on the ones uh, that we think are better, i.e. the democracies, democracies do not like giving up power to the international stage. So how can we expect other countries to do that as well? So we need to really unpick that. And for me, this year is a critical year. Two billion people are going to vote in 50 different countries. And so what we need is somehow to actually educate people into all of these issues, the global and the planetary commons, to be able to make sure that they're all global citizens. They all understand that actually what we do as a collective is really important. And for me, the five times faster is about governance. How do we get government? How do we get governments to actually put in place the protections for our natural environment? How do we actually lift people out of poverty? And how do we decarbonize and change the economy so we actually protect everything? And I think if we think holistically and we think joined up about human well-being and the natural world, and, and I love the concept of the planetary commons, I think that this century will be able to do that. But fundamentally, we humans have to stop thinking as individuals, and we have to think as a global planetary species. Thank you, Mark. Um, always love the bigger picture. Uh, yeah, it's it, it, it's making me think so much more on, on that global sort of side of things. And yeah, edgy is part of the, the, the change that we need as well. And, I think um, it, uh, va the, the way we value our planetary systems, I think needs to be brought into our school curriculums because I just don't feel that enough people understand and can connect the dots between the value I we're in the state that we're in right now. Um, but listen, we're, we're, we're going to move on now because we have our next uh, section because uh, uh, we're going to come to a new segment in our monthly meetings where we hear views and, and insights from climate activists from all around the world. Um, and I'm delighted to introduce our first climate voice, and that is Beth Doherty. Hi everyone, my name is Beth Darity and I'm a 20-year-old climate activist, originally from Dublin, Ireland, but currently in my final year of my undergraduate law degree in the University of Cambridge. I've been involved with climate activism for about five or six years now, uh, working in climate justice and climate education, and now also in legal research and advocacy as an Arctic Angel, which is a network of young people around the world working to protect the Arctic with global choices. And so when I was reading some of the material on the planetary commons, I was really struck by how I think a lot of it is applicable to the Arctic, um, particularly as a region that all of us are dependent on. The Arctic is absolutely critical to the Earth and to the Earth's ecosystem. Um, it's essentially the air conditioning of our global system, um, and in particular the albedo effect is absolutely essential to the functioning of our global systems. Uh, we need the Arctic to reflect the sun back up into the atmosphere. We also need it to regulate global temperatures, and if we lose the Arctic, which is a region that is warming three times faster than the rest of the world, and we've also lost 95% of the thickest ice, and that is the ice that we really need. But once that ice is broken by a ship, 
for example, it never heals back to the same thickness. And we are already seeing devastating loss of ice in this region. Um, and as Global Choices says, we can't plant ice. Once it's gone, it is gone. And it's a region we need to act to protect because once we lose it, we have lost it for good. And we are already facing the possibility of ice-free summers by 2030, which could potentially lead us to tipping points, which would have devastating impacts on Earth's system. And also really importantly, what happens in the Arctic doesn't stay in the Arctic. And so it's a region that affects all of us, though we might all not all be from, that we might not all live in, but which is really crucial for the survival of our overall planet and something that we need the global community to rally around. And as a law student myself and as someone who's worked in legal advocacy, something I'm really passionate about and would like to bring up is the moratorium, which is being proposed by Global Choices, which is essentially a 10-year precautionary pause on industrial activity in the centre of our Arctic Ocean. Because despite the loss of this commons, which we all need, which we all depend upon, some are seeing this as an opportunity for short-term economic gain, including the possibility of transport or shipping um, in the ice-free summers, which would have devastating consequences for the 21,000 unique species of flora and fauna, as well as the water and other issues with um, the general health of the system if that were to happen. And we are also seeing increased risks of deep sea mining and other industrial activities either starting or expanding. And essentially, this is a precautionary pause, not to say that humans cannot work with nature, but rather that we need to take a pause, assess the situation and do what is best for the Arctic to structure our systems around nature rather than seeking to dominate it. And essentially, and again, this is something I was struck by with the concept of planetary commons, saying that we should reject this pursuit of short-term economic gain for a very small group of people and instead prioritise the long-term sustainability and survival of the global systems upon which we all depend. And this is really key, I think, to what we're discussing today, because although the moratorium would focus on a central Arctic Ocean, which is the area beyond, on the central Arctic Ocean, which is the area beyond national jurisdiction, the Arctic also has regions within states. There are several Arctic states. And we also need collaboration between these states and we need collaboration with the entire global community to rally around and protect the Arctic. Um, because as I said, what happens there does not stay in the Arctic. We need strong cross-border action to protect the Arctic, both the region beyond national jurisdiction and the region within national jurisdiction. And we need really strong global leadership to prioritise the survival of the Arctic over any short-term economic gain. And in fact, the economic costs, if we lose the Arctic, will far outstrip this short-term economic gain, uh, which the majority of us will not benefit from. So in my opinion, the planetary commons is all about recognising that our global responsibility goes beyond short-term economic profit for the few and instead protecting nature and recognising that we are a part of it, that we are dependent on regions like the Arctic. And that's what this moratorium as a legal innovation is really trying to do. It's trying to take a pause for the Arctic and also encouraging collaboration between Arctic states and between the global community to protect the Arctic with particular priority for those who live and depend upon the Arctic and the indigenous communities who've been the custodians of this region for millennia. And so I suppose building on all of that, something I would be really keen to see the committee discuss is what is the role of proposed legal innovations like the moratorium in protecting the global and planetary commons? And how can we ensure they're implemented both in building political consensus and momentum and also in ensuring the effectiveness and enforcement of these mechanisms? And how do you see the Arctic fitting into all of this? So thank you so much. That was really, really cool. Uh, um, you highlight the critical role of the Arctic and it and it's call for people to rally around to protect it, which can only be achieved with strong cross-border cooperation and global leadership. So uh, um, if I can unpack your question for our panel, I'd start Optic fitting into the planetary commons. So I'll take that to, to Professor Johan Rockstrom first. And also, um, Professor Rockstrom, could you also give people a, a short sort of description of what the albedo effect is, which um, Beth mentioned as well, please? Yeah, thanks. Well, to, to begin, I think I think what what, what Bev shared with us is uh, right right on target, and and the Arctic is on the list of proposed candidates as planetary commons. Not only that, as we know, the Arctic is is um, is really one of the canneries in the gold mine because the Arctic is warming three times faster than the planet, on average. So things are moving so fast, 
changing so fast in the Arctic. I put the tropical coral reef systems and the Arctic as the two fastest changing commons on planet Earth. And the Arctic is his home, as I mentioned earlier, to four million people dominated by indigenous communities. So here we have a prime example of a system that, that needs urgently, urgently, a collective governance regime. Albedo is is the measurement of reflectivity on planet Earth. It's Think of it just as the color. The, the lighter the color, the whiter the surface, the, the higher is the reflectivity. So we know that a healthy ice sheet, a healthy Arctic, reflects roughly 90, 90% of incoming solar radiation back to space. So you could you could think of the Arctic as a, as a planetary air conditioner. It, it's a cooling system for planet Earth. When ice melts, the surface gets darker, and you come to a point where more than 50% of incoming solar radiation is absorbed, and that is a tipping point. The moment where the surface absorbs more than it reflects, that is a permanent, irreversible tipping point. Why does this happen? Well, a liquid surface, when ice melts, is darker than an ice surface. So albedo is fundamental. It's one of these big, powerful uh, control factors for the stability of the planet. Thank you so much, Professor Roksham. I mean, that is why the Arctic is so important and it's so important that it's incorporated into what we do with the planetary commons. Now, it's um, a timely moment for us to go to Professor's shared ACCAG field report about her research search expedition to the Denman Glacier in East Antarctica. Hi, everybody. It's great to be back at a public meeting of the Climate Crisis Advisory Group. I've spent the last three months in Antarctica. Um, we were there to study the Denman Glacier, which is a part of East Antarctica that we're particularly concerned about as the climate continues to warm. We're concerned about Denman Glacier because the ice in that glacier is set on ground that is a long way below sea level. In some parts, it's thought to be around 3.5 kilometres below sea level where the ice is sitting on the bedrock. And that means that it's in a potentially very unstable situation, particularly as the ocean around Antarctica continues to warm. Um, so with that, that configuration of that subglacial uh, basin. What that means is that as the ocean warms and begins to cause the glacier to retreat and the ice shelves in front of it to become unstable, then the, the glacier as it retreats backwards um, has more and more of it exposed to that warm water. And it's a very effective way of destabilizing ice and contributing to rapid sea level rise. So if we were to lose the ice that's held within Denman Glacier, that would raise global sea levels by around about 1.5 metres globally. So this is a really significant part of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet, but it's a, it's a part of the East Antarctic Ice Sheet that we know very little about. So I was in Antarctica as part of a huge scientific campaign uh, being run by the Australian Antarctic Program. It was a program where we had 27 scientists all working to study different aspects of this glacier. So we had scientists who were going out and using seismometers um, and magnetic measurements to be able to understand the structure of the ice, um, to be able to understand and measure um, accurately what the bedrock beneath looks like and even deeper layers of the earth underneath that we had people who were there studying the past history of the ice sheet, uh, people who were out on the ice shelf and drilled down through that ice to access the ocean beneath and take measurements of the temperature of the ocean and look at the the, um, the marine sediments in front of the glacier. Um, and I was there leading the ice drilling team. And so as part of my team, uh, we had just a really small group, just four of us who would go out um, and camp in a satellite camp. Um, and we would be in those satellite camps for between sort of a week um, to almost four weeks for the, the one that we were there for the longest for. Um, at one of those sites, we drilled 200 metres down into the ice. And as we drill down through the ice, we're drilling back in time through layers of ancient snowfall um, that have fallen in this area around Denman Glacier. And we collect those ice samples. And what that allows us to do is to then measure um, the chemistry 
of that ice um, and the different properties of it to be able to use that to reconstruct how the climate in this part of Antarctica has varied naturally over time and then to look at how that's changing now. So we have that context for how the conditions that this glacier is existing in are changing and what that tells us about how likely or how quickly we can expect this glacier to change in the future. Uh, so for the, the ice samples that my team collected, uh, we have a huge amount of material now that we'll be working through in the lab for the next few years to develop those past climate records. Um, and the other teams of scientists who are part of this project have also come away with um, enormous amounts of data so that we can really understand just how vulnerable this system is and what, what we need to do if we want to try and protect this ice to make sure that that scenario where we lose this ice and add an extra 1.5 metres to global sea level just from this glacier, that's a situation that we really want to avoid for the future. Um, and so in terms of protecting um, the, the planet planetary commons, which the, we're talking about in this meeting today, um, this is the scientific information that tells us what it is that we need to do to ensure that we protect this part of the Earth system. Uh, so I hope you enjoy the meeting tonight um, and I look forward to talking again with you in another meeting. Nearly, Professor Avram, um, we enjoyed having you back on the um, on the show. That was uh, extremely informative. Um, now, Professor Abram mentions the dangers of losing this ice and the extreme rise in sea levels. I think she talked about 1.5 metres global sea level rise if we lose the Denman Glacier. All right, so, Dave, perhaps I could come to you on this one. Um, what could we expect to see if we get to this point? The work that uh, uh, Nerali is doing and her team is so critically important. We we know that over the last year, 2023, we lost so much more of the, the ice sitting on the ocean around the, the whole of Antarctica. And that is frightening because that was keeping the ice on land intact, keeping it cooler. You remove that, that blue surface is once again heating up the, the land mass around it. But the worst problem is, as Nerali was saying, the warm water coming in from below. Uh, and while several of us are, are working on how we might keep the ice that is formed over the Arctic Sea during the polar winter, keep it there during the polar summer, the challenge of the Antarctic is really considerably greater. And nobody's come up with a real solution for that. So I, I just think... We are now alerted to what is happening in the Antarctic as well as the Arctic, and we need considerable more studies of the kind that Nerali is describing so well. Um, we also then need to focus on how we might counteract these natural system effects, if, if it's possible at all. We all know that we must have deep and rapid Im uh, reduction of emissions, but, but we also need to understand that we've put too much in the way of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere already, because otherwise these things would not be happening at this point in time and at this temperature rise. So there are many, many lessons for us to take on board from these scenarios, which are really discomforting. Mm -hmm. Thank you uh, so much for that, Sir David. And uh, it's a very sobering point for us, I'm afraid, to leave our session today. But as always, I'd like to thank everyone who's joined us and to thank you to everyone who has tuned in. And uh, please share this meeting with everyone in your networks. We want to get this to as many people as possible. But until next time, goodbye for now. <laughs>